Today is Monday, November 14th, 2022, and you're listening to the Ask a Christian podcast. I'm your host, Nate. Today, let's talk about Luke 45, I believe, and where the angel came to give strength to Jesus. Why was that necessary? Revelation 13, 8, the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. Did God make stuff happen? Did God just observe stuff happen, like a snow globe outside looking in? Um, you know, basically, does God know stuff, and how does he know it, and why does he know it? Uh, the Ten Commandments of Climate Change, that's a fun one. And I think, is it Union Seminary? Uh, you know, apostasy in general. Good conversations, a little bit of a case of the Sleepy Mondays, but stay tuned for more. And also find us on askachristian.podbean.com and rumble.com slash askachristian and bitshoot.com slash askachristian. Have an awesome day, and we will see you later. Goodbye. Hello, Saint. Are you speaking? morning my you popped up from my pocket i don't know how i joined your room good morning oh <laughs> well welcome anyways How's are you going you're so a, far? uh no the traffic um 15 minutes late to work there's oh. tons of snow and ice in minnesota so it's just a slow oh. ride well drive safe uh, do you know, so you're a Trinitarian, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, and Luke, uh, it's like 43, Jesus prays to God, like right before he's about to get crucified. And he's like, take this cup from me. And then it says, uh, angel from heaven came to give Jesus strength. Do you know, do you know why I, like an angel had to come give Jesus strength? Off the top of my head, no. But how does that have to do with the Trinitarian thing? Well, just like if, because if, if I lean towards Trinitarian big time, but I just don't understand, like, because if Jesus had all the power the Father had, I don't know why an angel came or had to come to give them strength you know what i mean well if you look at like i think it's colossians 3 it says you know jesus being uh, completely equal with god uh, didn't take advantage of that and it says instead he took the form of a lowly servant so if some if someone is completely equal with god i.e god they are god jesus is god but he didn't consider that something to be taken advantage of so he lowered himself into the form of a servant well, I mean, it makes sense how if you willingly lower yourself to the form of a servant, you're going to put yourself, you're going to humble yourself and put yourself under the Father. This is why Jesus says the Father is greater than all. And Colossians also says Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God. So this is all willingly a choice of Jesus. And then if you take that, you know, Jesus says when he's about to be crucified, you know, his disciples are saying, no, no, you'll never die and he rebukes them and says no no <laughs> this this is the whole point this is why i'm here to lay my life down and then he goes on to say no one takes my life from me i lay it down and if i lay it down i can take it up again well who can resurrect people only god so if jesus lays his own life down and he will take his own life up again so if people just read you know a couple verses here and there they can make it say you know pretty much anything they want but if people really take the whole Bible into consideration for their points, it just it just becomes way more clear. So, like, you know, if, if people said, just stopped with a few verses and said, oh, look, an angel had to give Jesus strength because, because why? I mean, there's plenty of normal people, like actual humans, like no claim of divinity that, you know, endured uh, torture, uh, Peter, like upside down crucifixion. Like there's plenty of regular mortal people that endured the same or more suffering than, than like a regular crucifixion. I mean, not counting like the weight of sin, but just like the physical suffering and, you know, being fed by lions and ripped apart in the arenas. And, you know, we're not told angels gave them strength. So just the fact that, that an angel came to give Jesus strength doesn't mean like it had to, an angel had to give Jesus strength or what? He would have like ran away and hit or something? Like that's what his disciples tried to argue him to do. They tried to argue you know, to fight and fight against these people. But he's like, no, no, this is why I'm here. This is what my entire earthly life is about. This is, this is the point. Like, I'm not going to run away. I'm not going to fight. Like they have to kill me. That's why I'm here. So yeah, I know that doesn't an answer 
why an angel came, but I think the answer is why an angel didn't come. Like Jesus didn't need an angel, just like all the other mortal people who have suffered and died as martyrs didn't necessarily need angels to help them with their mission. Um, so if it was like, a, you know, even Elijah, look back at Elijah, like how, you know, it says an angel came and baked him a cake uh, and things like that. So, you know, could it be some, some ministering form of, I don't know, comfort or something like that? Who knows? But um, yeah, that's what I would say. It definitely didn't have anything to do with, I don't know, talking him into sticking around for cruci- uh, to be crucified. His disciples tried that and he rebuked them. Yeah, I just thought like that they, it's just like the angel gave God strength. I'm just, it's, do you know what I mean? It's just kind of, I don't, I don't know exactly. I still don't even know. Like, do you believe God, uh, so like God knew that Jesus, he was going to slay Jesus before the foundation, but how, what did that look like? Did did God, so like all the people who rose up against him, did, did God make them do that or what, you know what I mean? Like how did, how did, uh, Christ die before the foundation of the earth or did God just know that people were going to do it? You know what I mean? Yeah, well, no one else is talking, so why don't we just look some of these verses up? So, hang on. Let me shoot this guy in Fortnite real fast. That's right. I can do two things at once. All right, let me get to a good hiding place here. All right, let's start with the foundation of the world thing. It's in Revelation 19 or 21. All right, let's see. Revelation, oh, I was wrong, 13, 8. Um, let's see. And all that dwelt upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Let's see. I think it's in a couple of months. I'm still here, just looking around. It's telling me Revelation 13, 8. I don't think that's right. I think there's an, there must be another reference. Unless I'm just going crazy. You just Google, like, Jesus is predestined to die scripture. Jeez, I guess it is Revelation 13.8. Like, we can see that, that Jesus came to be the Savior, so we can see that God sent him. He lived his life, and he was killed. But how, how did that play out? You know what I mean? Like, because the Calvinists are like, yeah, God made made them, and they got a good a good argument for that. Uh, 
Uh, what'd you say about the Calvinist? They have a they have a good argument for that. I got yelled at by Calvinists and somebody else because I said that God forced those people to kill Jesus. Well, no, but I mean, what does that have to do with the foundation of the world thing? Before the foundation. So, like, God knew Jesus was sent, and God knew people were going to kill him, right? Even yeah. before. So, like, I'm just, I try to practically see how that falls into place. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, and everything I'm reading is, is just kind of saying what I always thought yeah there, there is no greater context or hidden meaning i mean it seems like all these sources are like you know saying the same thing that you would get from just reading it but yes I, I mean god's plan was always like you know from the moment of you know let there be light or whatever god always knew jesus was going to die uh, like he was always going to be the sacrifice but that's completely irre irrelevant from did god force the people to murder him or not like that's a whole other issue so the fact that you know if people and, and also it says, you know, those whose names are not written in the Lamb's Book of Life, the, the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world. That doesn't mean, to the Calvinist point or not, that's also irrelevant. Like, it's just told people's names are written. So, some would say, well, God knows that because, you know, these people chose, God knew these people are always going to choose to follow Jesus. And, you know, because of that, he, like, retrofitted their names in the Book of Life because he always knew they were going to be in the Book of Life. Um, but that doesn't mean God forced them to. But the Calvinists would say, yes, God forced them to. So, you know, he, he always knew that, you know, saint was going to exist in 2022. So, you know, he pinned his name in the Lamb's Book of Life because God always knew he was going to elect him, uh, you know, eons ago. But, but I mean, that that is wholly irrelevant from, you know, I guess I think what we started talking about, which is, you know, Jesus was always going to be the sacrifice from the foundation of the world. Like nothing surprised God. He wasn't like, okay, I'm going to make a planet with Adam and Eve and Oh, oops, uh, they failed. I need something else. Who, what else can I use? Um, like, you know, we're, Jesus was always going to be that sacrifice. Good morning, Mark. I, I, I messaged Malik this question, and he's trying oh. to wave back to his talk, but now he's here. Hallelujah. So it sounds like oh, is that all it takes to get Malik in here, a private message? I've been, like, <laughs> sending the invites forever. Now I know no. the trick. No, I messaged him like three weeks ago. This time. Oh, oh, okay. Well, Malik, good he's timing. Really good, he's really getting me now. So. <laughs> no, um, yeah. Um, so, so we're, I guess we're saying we're, no to Calvinism. This we're talking about Revelation. I, I guess. I mean, it started out we were talking. He was asking about Revelation thirteen eight, or maybe I brought that up. I forget. But okay, so going all the way back, Saint, just want to recap this whole conversation. So yeah, the most recent thing was the Revelation thirteen eight, and you know, um, it started in Luke, Luke forty five. Saint, is that what your first question was? How an angel came to give strength Luke, to Jesus when he was pr praying? Luke forty three. Yeah, why why did an angel come and give uh, Jesus strength? Like, if he's God, like, he was healing people, doing all kinds of stuff. He had the power of God in him. But I just read yesterday that, and I was like, it just kind of caught me off guard. Why an angel came to give him strength. And it was kind of the question about, you know, the Trinity. <laughs> so it's like, well, you know, if Jesus was God or, you know, equal or something like that, why did he need an angel to come give him strength? And that's where the conversation began. Yeah, so so what we what we have is that when Jesus is on earth, um, we see a lot of times that the things he's doing, he doesn't do it by his own power. He does it by the power of the Father. So this is why he prays to the Father. The Father the Father is doing these things through Jesus. Um, oh, so I, God sent an angel then to give him power. That makes sense. Well, not to give him power, because again, Jesus is not relying on his own strength. Because remember, Jesus Jesus is representing us. We don't have the power Jesus does. But again, he is he's he's trying he is trying. He is he represents us in all things except sin. But just as just as as we are supposed to be reliant on God and trust God hundred percent, so is Jesus demonstrating that 
I trusted in the Father 100%. Uh, saying I just muted you a minute because you had some background noise. If you want to speak, go ahead and unmute. That makes sense because before or a little bit before or after that, he's like praying fervently to God. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, we moved on from that to uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, I think you, you brought up the foundation of the world thing. I, I don't think it started as a Calvin point, or maybe it did. I mean, you, you can tell us you're the one who brought it up. Just how, how I'm trying to wrap my mind around how God knew before the time of the world he was going to send his son as a sacrifice, and then how, how that played out. So, to God, do you know what I mean? Like, how did... God sent his son. Uh, he knew he was going to be the savior before the world. Mm -hmm. But how did it practically play out with him dying? Did God, Would Jesus like, did God, like, how did, how did he get sacrificed without God's hand and, like, making the other people kill him or, you know what I mean? Well, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, the, the most practical example, my, my gosh, look at the election we just had. Like, it, it would not take very, I mean, you've got a 50-50 shot. So, like, if, if you have one group of people that want one thing, it is not difficult to find, you know, another group of people that want the other thing. So, I mean, if God legitimately had no evil people on the planet, well, I mean, I guess there would no be no reason for Jesus or the fruit or any of that. But the fact that there is, you know, evil people on the planet as well as good people— it's not like God had to, I don't know, that's like one of the, you can't even call that a miracle. That's like one of the easiest things in the world. It, that's like saying, okay, half the people love Jesus, half the people hate Jesus. Um, okay, do I have to try to bend the will of man to make half of them want to murder him? Well, no, half of them love him and follow him. The other half already want to murder him. Like that, That's just like an odds game. So I would say that's that's like not even miracle territory. That's just like, we can, we can look around and see that in the last week. But before the before he even made all those people, how did he plan that? Because you know he I mean? saw it. He, he he saw it because it had already happened. Like the conventional understanding to like break your mind is God is not restrained by the linear timeline we are. Like God is outside of time or space or whatever you want to say. It makes it sound like all space agey, but it's really not. It's like if, if our world, our universe is our cosmos is playing out like a snow globe and God is the one, you know, watching that snow globe from the outside as well as, you know, however many other snow globes may exist, then, or if someone else is watching the snow globe, and then God is watching them, watch them, watch them, watch them. So basically, you know, God can see everything that's already happened, is happening, will happen. Um, so from God's view, yeah, I mean, it's just like you watching a movie. I just watched a movie I've seen a thousand times the other day because it's been a long time since I saw it. And I'm like, I know what's going to happen. I didn't force these actors to do this. I didn't force the script. I've seen it a million times. I know it by heart. But I'm going to watch it because, you know, I still want to. So, I mean, you know, all analogies break down, but it's not a bad one. I mean, just put, put, look at God through that lens. And I, I, like, it doesn't give me trouble at all. And all this without God forcing it. So, I mean, the Calvinism thing isn't even rel relevant here. Like, whether God, you know, forces someone's hand or not. It, it's, does God know what's going to happen? The Bible says God knows all things, and I believe that. God knows all things. But does God force all things? Does God allow all things? Does God, uh, I mean, so there's really no, the only thing is not whether or not God knows what's going to happen, what I'm going to do 10 minutes from now. It's, did God dominate my will to force me whatever I, I do 10 minutes from now, um, or not? And then the way Chris explains it, it really doesn't matter. Because, you know, the way Chris explains it is, you know, it was, it was even if God didn't force you, you were always going to do that any, anyway. And then he throws out compatibilism. So it's really a non-issue. It's like, okay, well, at the point we're saying, you know, God totally decreed what I was going to do. But if he didn't, I would have done it anyways. You may as well just say the guy's got choice. Like, that, that's such a non-issue. Uh, Malik, what do you think? Well, I, didn't hear, I didn't hear half the things you said because I slipped away. But um, compatibilism is... Did God ordain that? About <laughs> not true, and uh, no, um, yeah, yeah. So when you look at when you look at these issues, like for example, like we we have to understand that God knowing things is not God causing them. 
for, for example, and this is again, this is a limited example. If I put a five year old kid in a chair and then I put two bags, two bags on a table, one's a bag of rocks and one's a bag of candy, without him choosing yet, I know what he's going to choose. Everyone knows what he's going to choose. He's not going to choose in the rocks. He's choosing the bag of candy. Why? Because we know it's a five-year-old kid. In the same way, God knows all of us. And he doesn't have to cause things for them to happen. He just basically sets the scenario correct because he knows our desire. Mankind is wicked. All he had to do is put Jesus on earth. And the rest kind of fell into place because men kind of wicked. So, like, he didn't plan before he made everything to send Jesus. No, that, 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 was, that, was, that was the plan, but that's not him, God, causing it. In other words, I can plan to get a promotion. I don't give myself a promotion. Do you, do you understand what's what's hard for me to wrap? So, like, before he made the first human, did he plan to send Jesus? Christ? Yes. Yes. So I before he, he even, yeah, go knew we were gonna sin, yeah. he already planned to send Christ. No, no, no I'd no. say he always knew we were going. To he sin. always knew we were gonna sin. So like, but okay. So like, he's our entire lives. I believe has been played out. We've made our own own decisions. Christ has always died. All history has already been, already been written. All future has already been written. Uh, you know, revelation has already been fulfilled. Everything is already done. God sees everything that has already happened. Like the future. Basically, I don't know if this will be more confusing or helpful. He sees the future in the past. Does that help? Like basically everything that has ever been done and ever will be done. God already like sees it as if it has already happened. So at that point, he's just hitting play. And you know, this stuff is playing out in our timeline. So whenever something in the future happens, we're like, wow, I had no idea that was gonna happen. God's like, yeah, I did. Saw it a thousand times. That includes, you know, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Mm -hmm. So that God did it. So that that's that's like kind of that's what I believe is that God knew what was going to happen. So then he sent Christ. But sometimes the scripture or it makes me like just reading it plainly sees like before he even made Adam, he sent Christ. He was, that was his plan. He was going to send Christ yeah. like without yes. knowing. That's, you know, but yeah, that's true. The scripture does say that. I mean, the scripture does, does allude to that. Why? Because again, he knew that mankind were going to sin already. In other words, it wasn't like, hmm, let me create humans and I'm going to make them sin, so I have to send Jesus. You know, it's like, I'm creating humans and I know they're going to sin. This is why the whole plan from the beginning is, I will send Jesus. Yep. You a little more clear on that saying, or still got questions? It's kind of, like, do you? I think you understand, like, what I'm saying, like, because if yeah, God, we, we we understand. This is why we're saying that what we're saying. So God did it. Cause he it. did it. Plan. No, no, no. You keep using the word plan. Christ. No, he did plan to send Christ. But we're saying he did not before cause he it. made the world. Yes, he did plan to send Christ before, before the world. Started. Yes, he did. So before he made Adam and Eve, yes, he already planned to send Christ. Yes, he did. So then, if he he planned to send Christ, mm -hmm. how before he made Adam and Eve, how did he know Adam and Eve were going to send? Because he knows all things. To even send Christ. Because he yeah, knows I mean, all you're, things. This is really getting. I, I don't know what else to say. Like this, this is like analytical to a fault. Like another, another uh, God, God doesn't have to create someone to know what they're going to do. God already knows all things. Every single detail, God knows it all. 
And just to be clear, this is not knows every possible, possible possibility. He, he actually knows specifically what is going to happen. Yeah, he knows all. I mean, I mean, really, it comes down to, you know, mechanics are where, I don't know, mechanics is where so many people get, get stuck. And it's like, okay, mechanically, we don't know everything. I mean, you know, Jesus calls us, us sheep. I mean, you know, there, there's more to that. I mean, we're not furry, woolly creature. Well, woolly creatures, but you know, sheep are pretty dumb. Pretty sheep are not the smartest uh, of all animals. So, you know, he compares us. You know, he's the shepherd, and we're the sheep. Um, it's like we're a bunch of, you know, not the smartest animals trying to like intellectualize the mind of the eternal God. So it's like, you know, good thing he didn't say you have to understand this for salvation. He said, repent and believe the gospel. So at a certain point, you know, do we believe the Bible where it makes the claim? And even though we don't understand every single thing about the claims it's making, you know, do we believe it? Regardless of, you know, if it happens one of a hundred ways, are any of those ways, you know, good enough for us to believe it? Are 30 of those ways? It, it doesn't matter. Like in some way, shape or form, the same way, you know, God, uh, you know, the lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. Uh, God knew that. Um, I mean, we've been talking, there's like, what, five or six scenarios we've thrown out? Do any of those have to be true for me to believe it? All those can be true for me to believe it. None of those. I could be completely wrong, yet it still be true. So the how and the why, you know, it's like my children, like asking me all these things. And at a certain point, I'm like, look, guys, just believe what I'm telling you. This is for your own good. Um, anyways, don't know if that helps. But I'd say, you know, you mentioned earlier, um, if you just plainly read the Bible... I'd say that's great. Like plainly reading the Bible on its face is good, but um, you know, like if you just plainly read a verse and plainly read a verse here and there and there, there's some confusion, and that either causes you to go deeper and get context, which you should do anyways. But if you just want to plainly read the Bible, you have to plainly read the entire Bible, and most of it will answer itself. But you have you can't just plainly read a verse here and there. You got to plainly read the whole thing. Um, anyways, that would be what I would say. Thanks, guys. Yeah, that's what you guys have said is what I believe, but it just kind of challenged my what I believe. If that makes sense. Sure. So, Malik, how was your weekend? It was actually uh, pretty good. Pretty good. What was your Sunday sermon about? Uh, my Sunday sermon about was. Um, um, Abraham being blessed, making a distinction between God giving Abraham a promise and then giving him a blessing. And so, um, just a distinction. And I just made it, you know, my comment was more a lot of Christians, a lot of Christians, you know, we rightly live on the promises. Um, and that's great. Um, but, but part of living out our Christian life is the actual blessing. So in other words, I am blessed by living out Christian values. I am blessed by, you know, holding Christian morale. I am blessed by participating in, you know, Christian worship. And, and, and a lot of us, a lot of Christians are just satisfied by saying, oh, well, I accepted Jesus. You know, Chuck, 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 I'm a Christian, Chuck. And they're not concerned about Christian living. And so we use examples like Abraham, doing what God tells him to do. That's his Christian living. I mean, that's what, you know, that's his, his, you know, God abiding living. And so because of these things, we see that, that God blesses him um, on top of the promise. How about you, Chris? How was your weekend? Baptize any babies? <laughs> yeah, 75. <laughs> Did you get you got a sprayer and you spray them all? <laughs> you know, I was I was annoyed once on a different subject. Easter Sunday, I went with uh, when I first met my wife. She was she was like she was like sort of Catholic, Catholic like you know one of the Catholic in name only. Name only. Mm -hmm. I'm hearing echo. I call it. I can send you a headset for the low low price of sixty thousand uh, dollars. Anyway. Um, but my wife was, you know, like Catholic in name only. And, uh, but she still like, you know, went to the big Catholic services, like, you know, Christmas, uh, Easter, stuff like that. So I, uh, you know, whenever I first met her, I'm, 
I was like moving around. I didn't have a home church. We were just kind of, I was just kind of looking whatever city I was in for something. I'm like, okay. I'm like, you know, I've never really been to Catholic churches. I probably won't burst into flames. I'm like, all right, well, you know, find a church and I'll look around for my churches and, you know, we'll go to yours one week and we'll go to mine one week and we'll just, we'll just do that. So, you know, we did that for a few months. It didn't last long. Uh, it was pretty quickly. She's like, ah, you know, I don't think I like this Catholic thing now that I'm actually going to Catholic church. Uh, she's like, I, I think you're right. I'm like, oh, that's wonderful. Um, she'll never say that about any other aspect of her life, but, you know, as far as the Protestant church. Um, anyway, but w one Easter Sunday, we went to this like big stone Catholic church and, you know, I like the architecture. It's cool. But, um, you know, I, I, <laughs> I got lots of scowls because uh, I'm like, Jesus does not pay attention if I stand or kneel. So like, I never did that. I just like sit in my seat and, and drew lots of scowls from, from church congregants. But um, anyway, the, this uh, priest or whatever was like going down with a little incense burner or like, oh, is Palm, Palm Sunday or whatever where they had like this giant palm branch and we're like, you know, waving this thing and like dipping it. And it was like, it was like a splash zone at SeaWorld. Like he was like spraying everyone. And I got like really, uh, really just hosed down, uh, probably extra because I wasn't doing the standing kneeling thing. Anyway, baptizing ba babies and Malik with a spray, spray gun just made me think of that. So that's my experience in Catholic churches. It's like the log ride at Disney and uh, Cisco's. Yes, I mean much better than you know being burned alive, but um, yeah, that was my experience. You know, I, I would never like I, I visited Catholic churches and I I mean, I've, I've shared in Catholic churches. I never kneeled in a Catholic church. Every time everyone kneeled, I just sit down. Yeah. <laughs> like, uh, yeah, I get it. Uh, we're not worshiping the same God, so even <laughs> I, I I can't be like, well, in my little section of my pew, I'm worshiping the true God, and you guys are not. This is not the Freemasons. <laughs> mm. Interesting, right? I sense a larger point. No, I just wear stuff when you need her. <laughs> We're not worshiping yeah. the same God. Catholics yeah. are not Christians. No. Do you make the blanket claim all Catholics are not Christians? In terms of the sense of their doctrine and theology, yes. In terms of individuals, I mean, there could be people, you know, that are that are Christians that have heard the gospel and repented and believed, and they could be thoroughly deceived in some church, but not for their whole lives. So, for instance, there will be Catholics who will be Christians, but the definition of them being Christians, they will come out of the Catholic Church. If they remain in the Catholic Church their entire lives, then that is belying the fact they were never truly of the faith. Was it you that was telling me the, or someone was telling me like the Pope um, came up with those Ten Commandments of climate change? Was that you or someone else? That wasn't me. I don't pay that much attention to papists. Yeah, well, someone mentioned it. Yeah, I, I never know the news unless someone says, you know, why the Pope is an Antichrist this week. And I'm like, oh, okay, why is that? Uh, okay, so someone, I think last week, was telling me the Pope came out with these Ten Commandments of Climate Change, and I saw, like, an article this morning that talked about, like, a larger group. So I guess it is a thing. I, I spent about ten minutes looking and couldn't specifically find if the Pope was was uh, doing the to-be-mentioned thing. But apparently there is, like, a large multi-faith group, which, I mean, by the point, I mean, multi-faith, great. In theory, unity, coming together, blah, blah, blah. In reality, like anytime I hear like interfaith or multi-faith, I'm just like apostates all. Um, but apparently there's a large multi-faith gathering of, you know, all kinds of religions. And they're going to uh, Mount Sinai to do their, their various prayers. I mean, if that doesn't harken back to Elijah and, you know, not being amused. Um, apparently they're going to do all the various prayers and rituals and, you know, like smashing these like 10 commandment tablets, uh, like Moses trying to get God to, or whatever God they're praying to, to, you know, answer their prayers or something about climate change. I couldn't find out whether or not the Pope was involved in that. That may be Gold, even too, too much Catholic for him. Out. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I couldn't find if the Pope specifically was involved in that, but I'm like, oh my gosh, like it, it's like. I don't know. There's got to be some like divine, divine like prophetic thing going on because otherwise, if people were trying to like you know make a mockery or not, like it's like it doesn't seem like that's their intent. It seems like they legit they're not trying to do it to like thumb and nose and like you know the face of God. But <laughs> that's pretty much what's happening, and it's like history repeating itself. So it's like unless these people are just so 
ignorant, and this is so coincidental. It's like, this has got to be like, you know, I don't know, the hand of God moving in some way. Like, you just don't get, like, this spot on, like, like faux, I don't know, faux Bible stuff repeating. Do you know what I'm try trying to say? Can you help me out? I'm struggling for words. But it's like, either this is an incredible coincidence, or this is really like some kind of hand of God moving. Because people are, are not this dumb. They can't be. Yeah, I mean, I think it's... I think it's the same as the, the Pharisees that walk away after Luke 4 wanting to murder Jesus. It, it's exactly the same thing. It's like they, they don't care about the God of the Bible. They will use all the trappings of it to mock him. And that's what they do. I mean, it's the same thing with the... Um, you guys know about... Uh, oh, man. Malak, what's the name of that seminary up in New York? Um, it's like the... the one of the oldest seminaries that's like super, super apostate now. I'm trying to remember the name. I was going to say Dallas Seminary, but that's, that's, that's in Dallas. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, it was a... Uh, uh, anyway, so it's where, um, it's where uh, Liberation Theology guy, uh, John, or not John, uh, they haven't talked about Liberation Theology in a long time, so core, uh, what's his wow. face? Come on, crossing the, the, the crossing the lynching tree guy. Nope. Dang it. Uh, David Wilkerson? David. No, that's the crossing the switchblade. Oh. The, uh, no. Uh, anyway, so that guy. Oh, Union Seminary. Thank you. Gee whiz. Oh, so, I've been having. Dude, yeah, Union on. Seminary up in New York. Um, they had a worship service at the seminary for trees. <laughs> and that's not, that's not like, oh, you know, we're going to do this, you know, inter no, no, no. Like, that's just Satan doing Satan. Satan going to Satan. Satan's going to Satan. And he's got his followers, and they're, they're going to do their thing, and they're going to worship the trees, man. And, they, and it's online. You can go watch it, Nate. You'd love it. It's, it's Tree Worship Service Union Seminary. It's just, it's fantastic in terms of how utterly satanic it is i mean that's not very climate friendly of them i mean i guess they have just different agendas because you know trees are carbon and carbon is bad even though trees reduce carbon but you know science yeah, i mean I, 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 I don't know if i'd call union seminary an actual seminary how do they worship the yeah, trees you know. what they do burning the smoky what they do <laughs> what did they do chris did they like dance around it or like pray to them or what, how did they worship they had, the trees? Like, and it wasn't it was like they had like trees in little pots and they were just like you know apologizing to well, the trees there you have it you know like worshiping they put tree in the pot and, and say oh you know tree self we're so sorry for our against the earth and yeah it was, it's, it's quite entertaining so so they so they kneel down and they apologize for rolling the tree up into a blunt and smoking it. That's what they be doing. They be apologizing to the tree. I mean, that's more of like the gift of the tree to them, I suppose. You know, that's that's more of the that's more of the the uh, burning incense kind of portion of the service. I would imagine. I don't know, man. That's like the, that's like the well, that's like the four twenty church, right? Like in in California or whatever. Like you know how they they uh, you know get like super baked and like you know praise yah or Ra or whatever their name is for you know this gift of the herb oh is that uh is that bethel church oh wait no 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 <laughs> no no it's like an actual i i i i think it's i think it's 420 church or church 420 but it's it's like a bunch of kind of um oh, like rasta type um yeah congregants who, uh, you know, the whole thing is, you know, I guess worshiping a specific tree in a very different way. So let me, let me read you the vision of Union Seminary. This is going to be, this is amazing. So this is the vision. Education at Union Theological Seminary is deeply rooted in the critical understanding of the breadth of Christian tradition yet significantly instructed by, by the insights of other faiths. It makes connection between these traditions and the most profoundly challenging issues of our con a contemporary experience. The realities of suffering and injustice, world religion pluralism, and fr fr uh, fr uh, fr the fragile, fr 
fragility of our planet uh, and discoveries of modern science. Union envisions a future in which teaching and learning continues to to encompass the spirit. So it's the spirit, lowercase s. <clears throat> Supporting the record of academic excellence and a deep co- commitment of social justice. Union <laughs> envisions the graduates and uh, graduates changing the world by practicing their vocation with dedication that brings religi- that brings a religi- religiosity grounded, critical, and compassionate presence to the majority to the major personal and social, political, and science realities of our time. Oh yuck. Yeah. Can you feel the Jesus? Can you feel the Jesus? Yeah. James <laughs> Cohn. That's who I was looking for. James Cohn. He wrote Black Liberation Theology in, in the 70s, and he wrote um, The Cross and the Lynching Tree and a bunch of other books. Those like are the two I've read. What, would your, what was your uh, Yelp review on these books? Does, does Yelp do book reviews too? Or what was your Goodreads review? My Goodreads review on, on uh, Cross and Lynching Tree or on sure. uh, Cross oh. and Lynching Tree maybe one of the most racist tomes that I have read. Um, and I've read Mein Kampf, mind you. <laughs> so, you know, not great. Um, and uh, let's see. So Le- Black Liberation Theology is simply a retread of Catholic Liberation Theology from South America that basically attempts to blend Marxism like classical Marxism and Christianity. And so this was melding Black Panther, like Black Power, with Christianity with Marxism. Is basically the long and short of Black Liberation Theology. It's got it's got four point five stars on uh, Goodreads. Yeah, the half a star off would probably be the one star or half star review I would have given it. <laughs> but you, have you heard it? You know, you remember remember that uh, president we had? Um, what's his name? Barack Obama. Yeah, that guy. Yeah. Um, his pastor Jeremiah Wright in Chicago was an adherent to James Cone. GD America. GD America. I remember. Yeah, that guy. He's still around. He's still kicking around. He's Oprah's pastor, too. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, so, yeah, Jeremiah Wright character. He, he's he's a huge proponent of James Cone. And, like, Damon Richardson, if you've ever seen him, mm-hmm. like, he's a huge proponent of James Cone. So, so I'm reading some of the some of the some of the notes or some of the reviews. One of them says, "As a theologian, I need to be able to explain, for the sake of myself and my students at the church, why white supremacy is fundamentally anti antichrist." While there are many ways to do this, I am grateful for for Coney for helping me to do this and to understand the cross better. This book really is one of the, my best theological books. I've read in the last five years. Yeah. Read more books. Yeah. Yeah. I reply, read more books. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It, so, like this wet the cat food is the best food I've had in the last year. Expand your palate. <laughs> yeah. Chicken nuggets are the best thing ever. <laughs> um, but, you know, Cone is the theological underpinning for the current trend in attempting to paint. This is Malak and I were talking about this earlier today um, before we came here was uh, the ability to paint all Christians as what they call Christian nationalists. So this is the new buzzword. And so Christian nationalist is just another word for white supremacist is just another word for Nazi. And this is the theological underpinning for that. And the funny thing is that, I mean, the funny thing is that um, the majority of Christians are non-white. Um, so to say that Christian nationalism is like, like it's, it's talking about the white male. I'm like, what? What are you talking about? That's 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 a group within the Christian. That's not the majority. 
Yeah, but see, they're white and adjacent. Malak. Come on. Yeah. I mean, Malak, I mean, you have Larry Elder, like, uh, you know, a, a black man who is the face of white supremacy, they say. <laughs> so if, if Larry Elder and Asians <laughs> and Hispanics are white, then people who are actually white, um, which I guess is, you know, Asians, Hispanics, and, and black people who have a certain political bent, um, according to them, but, you know, people who are actually white, like on the color spectrum, um, there is definitely no hope for. But, I mean, there's no hope for, you know, Hispanics and Asians and actually black people um, in their eyes because they are actually white. <laughs> so, um, no hope for any of us. So, yeah, there you go. That's a... Uh... That's a good overview of the theological underpinnings of uh, of this new uh, term of Christian nationalism applied to all of us. Yeah, and I, it is, it's like, man, taking taking things and just turning them on their heads. Like, that is, I, I mean, Satan gonna Satan, stupid gonna stupid. But it's like, you know, you know whenever I, I have the, um, I mean, what is Christian nationalist like in America, Western America? What does that really mean, Christian? Like God, nationalist, country, like God, country, family. Like if, if you just like look at what someone could legitimately mean by Christian nationalist, you know, not burning crosses in people's yards or something like that. But it's like, okay, Christian. God given to Caesar, family, morals, value, God, family, nationalist, country. Yay. So generally speaking, you would want things that support God, family, and, you know, country and the sense of morality and things like that, which I mean, you know, by the time you say, uh, you know, God and family, um, I mean, those are, those are basically like the buzzwords that everyone that has a problem with Christian nationalism and, you know, calls it the opposite of what it, I guess, should mean. Um, they already hate the family. They already hate and, or also say they don't believe in God. Um, and they also hate the country. So, I mean, <laughs> I mean, I think something profound just happened. So, something profound just happened. Yeah. Um, not here. Um, <laughs> so, so like, have you heard this new thing that if you call somebody woke, that that's now a racial slur? Have you heard this? You're kidding. No, nope. I've not. That's the new claim. Goodness. Is there a factory where they just come up with this crap? Yes, it's called Yale University and Harvard University. <laughs> Well, I like the contrast between, like, you know, people were saying, like, woke, and I guess the, comba uh, you know, counter term is awake. So it's like woke versus awake. I'm like, okay, well, whatever. It's clever, I guess. So, um... Everyone took their sweet time getting here this morning. I have to run in like 10 minutes. Does anyone want to be around to keep us going, or shall we call it a morning? Yeah, I can't. I'm running on. I'm running around work, so, yeah. Yeah, and if you mod me, what will happen is Phil will come in here with a bunch of rabbis. Malak will flee, and I will be by myself for four hours, so no. All right. <laughs> Yeah, Phil, Phil's got quite the, uh, I guess, following from, uh, yeah. Malik, any final words of wisdom? All right, good talk, good talk, good to hear, good to hear. What's your day like, Chris? Are you fixing people's computers? Wow, just like that. All right, everyone. Well, I guess that's a sign. Yeah, I have to run. I may be back uh, later after I get some work done. But um, if not, maybe I'll see you all tomorrow. Have a good day, everyone. Take care.